Listen to them, the children of the night, what music they make. in literature and uh, yeah that was this and actually it was a comparison between the Dracula uh, of Stoker and Camilla of um, Le Fanu to see the differences and also the evolutions of vampires throughout uh, folklore until its final uh, characterization in the novels. It's always good business in literature isn't it? People write about vampires they're gonna sell the same with TV film industry yeah. no that always sells it's really interesting did they cover also the the folklore going across the world yeah they were speaking about but very briefly it was about turkey uh, in the ancient rome as well about the, the ghouls what we call the ghouls and uh, and uh, i try to remember the name of the of the turkish undead monsters who basically came at night and to drink the blood of the living turkey. of the Kolakas? Yeah, I think this is this one. Does that sound familiar? I, I wouldn't, I've never heard that before. Calicansados? Caraconjolos? I don't oh. know if I pronounced it right. Oh, that's interesting. Oh. Vampire folklore by regions. Oh, yeah, so it changes. So you've got Guliabani? Yeah, you and have glutton. Glutton is a, well, is a well known type of vampire. Glutton. Obur would mean glutton, but in Turkish folklore, the Obur or Tatar Ubir is a blood sucking shapeshifter of the night that can take on the form of a cat, dog, or beautiful woman. Interesting. And then it goes as far back and beyond as China. In Chinese folklore, Jiangxi is Chinese for stiff corpse, although it is also translated as a hopping vampire that goes out at night to drain the living of their qi, or energy, and sleeps in a coffin or cave during the daytime. In the Hebrew, uh, with the Bible, you have Lilith, Lilith. The Striges in Greece, the Lamia, the Ampusa, <laughs> the Strigoi in uh, Romania. But then Strega in Italian would just mean witch, would mean vampire. Oh, I don't know. It's vampiro, yeah, vampire, vampiro. Yeah, that's interesting. India as well. I think it's one of those ones that you find in every single corner of the globe, isn't it? It's curious. Yeah. And what is it about the garlic? Because that does seem to come with Bram's. Perhaps he looked at the, the belief of the locals. Yeah, it only seems to come from Transylvania. The question of garlic. I don't think it's outside of there very much. I need to check. There is a channel of a guy, an American guy, who is really interesting. Well, his name is John Solo. He does several podcasts and stories about origins of creatures, of some fairy tales sometimes. And I think he did about vampires, and I think he goes through several uh, passages like uh, what's the weapons against a vampire, for example? And he will go through all the different ways. There was a, f a specialist as well, I try to remember who it is, who explained actually basically in a more scientific reason why we came to the belief that all um, uh, garlic could be good against vampires. Oh, okay, they can't watch themselves into the mirror told him that was really really interesting well, i need to find them back yeah can you find the link because we could include that that could be wonderful because it could nice have it, a, put that as a it's kind of it's not a certitude but it could sense. still bring um a sense of explanations shall we say yeah, might... there was also legends about people being you know if people thought they were dead but they were actually being then um, buried alive. And, They've uh, gone into a catatonic state. 
Belief in vampires may have been given an extra boost during times of plague, when burial grounds filled up and corpses would be left exposed and rotting for lengthy periods of time. The bloating of the corpses from gases caused pressure on the lower body, causing blood to flow up from the lungs and into the mouth, leading people to believe that the corpse was in fact alive and feeding off blood. Well, that was a lot of rambling about vampires. But how did Bram Stoker end up writing Dracula? Indeed. Going out into places, writing about all the different people. And there are quite a lot of journalists, I mean... I think Bram Stoker started as one as well, I believe. Or was it, um, how we... Uh, not Walpole, but, um, ah! Anybody who keeps a journalist is basically a journalist. <laughs> so if they, they're writing it all down. <laughs> Bram Stoker was athletic with a degree in mathematics, a civil servant, a writer and a journalist in the sense that he was an unpaid drama critic for the Dublin Evening Mail. He certainly kept a journal because that's where he, he put in all these nightmares that he was having, like this one from 1890. A young man goes out, sees girls, one tries to kiss him not on lips but throat. And then six days later, he writes another entry in his journal and a new character has appeared. Is it a dream? Women stoop to kiss him. Terror of death. Suddenly, Count turns away. This man belongs to me. So that, that was in his nightmare, his second nightmare. And that's the line that goes into the book. Wow. Yeah. I mean, where did, where did these nightmares come from? I don't know. I think it could come from anything, anywhere. I mean, yesterday I was dreaming, actually. I was with my family in a sort of a horror tunnel, like in London Dendron. Oh. No, no, honestly, it really happened. <laughs> <laughs> Going from here and there. Uh, uh, wow. And, and, but had you been on a visit to London Tower, the yeah, dungeon? Yeah, for, for an audition, in fact, I was, I didn't get the job, but yeah. Right, so but then it, you, your brain was processing the location, the places, and then, yeah. I mean, most of it can be explained, but you have to wonder what kind of food was Stoker eating to get that kind of... So weird. Well, if you eat tomatoes, apparently tomatoes can cause nightmares. So. Oh my god, and I eat a lot of the tomatoes. Oh, you're gonna have nightmares tonight. <laughs> I, keep, I eat them every day. I must be having nightmares all the time and I can't remember them. <laughs> oh dear, I better stop eating tomatoes. Oh, and I, I have tomato soup that. for the whole day. I'm, I'm in such trouble. I... When you put salt or, or just pepper on a small tomato, on, to, on a sherry tomato, it's quite nice. It's hard to stop. Mm. Or if you eat, um, how do you call it? Tomatoes with fresh basil. Yes, yes. Nom, and, nom, nom. Uh, yeah, the toasted bread with with um, garlic and tomato. Okay, but if we have the garlic, we're not going to dream about vampires then, are we? <laughs> no, probably we're going to dream about <laughs> vampires running away from a giant garlic thing. <laughs> He got the garlic. He did go and do his research. Um, so he, he looked up a whole lot of material about Transylvanian. And he read a lot about the Romanian folklore. No, I can make a parallel with Dracula or Van Ensing, but he, he tried, like, the Count to understand, <laughs> basically, Transylvania like the Count trying to understand England. Because when, you know, when you have these scenes... The lamps were also lit in the study or library, and I found the Count lying on the sofa reading, of all things in the world, an English Bradshaw's guide. When I came in, he cleared the books and papers from the table, and with him I went into plans and deeds and figures of all sorts. He was interested in everything, and asked me a myriad questions about the place and its surroundings. He clearly had studied beforehand all he could get on the subject of the neighbourhood, for he evidently at the end knew very much more than I did. From Dracula, Chapter 2, Jonathan Harker's Journal. Probably for Carmilla there is Batori and for Stoker, 
that was Vlad Tepish, like the original Dracula. Vlad Tepish is the Romanian for Vlad the Impaler and refers to Vlad III of Wallachia, also known as Vlad Draculea, son of Dracul or Dragon, and considered a national hero of Romania. His father took the name after becoming a member of the Order of the Dragon. The Order of the Dragon was set up in 1408 for select members of the aristocracy by Sigismund of Luxembourg, then King of Hungary and Croatia. Definitely, because he, he did do a lot of research into that. And did you know that he wanted his publisher to publish Dracula as non-fiction? And the, the publisher got nervous and said, no, no, there'll be there'll be a panic. People will go absolutely crazy with fear. But we have to publish it. Yeah, we, we have that to publish it. Be, well, <laughs> that, will, that will not be funny at first, but that would have been great. I'd love it. I mean, I think it was smart sort of marketing ploy on part of Bram Stoker to say, you know, it's non-fiction, it's all true, you know, make, make the sales go through the roof. <laughs> but I think he, he partly because of having done the research, he basically was basing a lot of the characteristics on real people. He was basing events on the facts should we say, that he'd gleaned from mythology, folklore, and so on. So mm -hmm. in a sense, you could say, yes, it's it's non-fiction in, in that sense. <laughs> but but it's, it's a bit of a step <laughs> to say, you know, it's so many ways of interpreting the word non-fiction. Yes, I know, you looked it up in a book, but... <laughs> But it sounds great. I mean, it does, I mean this it? is one of the greatest idea to make publicity. But whether he actually believed that he was writing non-fiction sort of raises questions, you know, like, what, 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 was it really a marketing ploy? The novel Dracula was well received on its publication in 1897, with reviewers praising Stoker's use of horror. In the same way, negative critics viewed it as excessively frightening. And Dracula has never since been out of print, so perhaps Bram Stoker did not need to worry about marketing ploys. But maybe horror was not the unique selling point of the book, as Dr. Arnold Schmidt points out. You know, the, the best scholarship I've seen on Dracula is, is about the technology, because what really kills Dracula is the typewriter, right? She types up the notes. She is able to help them. So there's there's interesting intersections of the Gothic and technology. Twenty ninth September, after dinner, I came with Dr. Seward to his study. He brought back the phonograph from my room, and I took my typewriter. He placed me in a comfortable chair, and arranged the phonograph so that I could touch it without getting up, and showed me how to stop it in case I should want to pause. And then he very thoughtfully took a chair with his back to me so that I might be as free as possible and began to read. I put the forked metal to my ears and listened. When the terrible story of Lucy's death and, and all that followed was done, I lay back in my chair powerless. Fortunately, I am not of a fainting disposition. When Dr. Seward saw me, he jumped up with a horrified exclamation and hurriedly taking a case bottle from a cupboard gave me some brandy which in a few minutes somewhat restored me. As it was, I didn't know what to believe, and so got out of my difficulty by attending to something else. I took the cover off my typewriter and said to Dr. Seward, Let me write this all out now. We must be ready for Dr. Van Helsing when he comes. I have sent a telegram to Jonathan to come on here when he arrives in London, from Whitby. In this matter, dates are everything, and I think that if we get all our material ready, and have every item put in chronological order, we shall have done much. He accordingly set the phonograph at a slow pace, and I began to typewrite from the beginning of the seventh cylinder. I used manifold, and so took three copies of the diary, just as I had done with all the rest. It was late when I got through, but Dr. Seward went about his work of going his round of the patients. When he had finished, he came back and sat near me, reading, so that I did not feel too lonely whilst I worked. How good and thoughtful he is. The world seems full of good men, even if there are monsters in it. From Mina Harker's journal, Dracula. Le 
Vanu did the same, but apparently there was a, a tradition because in Camilla, they apparently, you know, the the father of the of the heroine is an ambassador, and they live in a in a small manor castle called a schloss. So I don't know if it's, uh, 